Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, February 11, 2024. It focuses on Jesus' transfiguration and the events immediately afterward. The message to all who will listen is Jesus is God's future-knowing, demon-commanding Son upon whom we depend for power to do our God-given work. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. God, thank you that you are here and that you desire for us to understand who you are and to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray, God, that you would do your work through me and in the hearts of each person here, including me. I pray, God, that you'll help us to understand who you are and worship you. And God, help us to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have never watched an entire episode of The Simpsons. Anybody else here never watched them? Okay, a few people who've never watched The Simpsons. But I am culturally aware enough to know that the show has a reputation for making accurate predictions about the future. So this is a thing that people actually care about, believe it or not. So let me give you a few examples of things that Homer and Marge and their kids and the rest of the yellow-skinned residents of uh, Springfield have gotten right over the years. In an episode entitled Bart to the Future, which aired first on March 19, 2000, grown-up Lisa became the President of the United States. Stranger things could happen. In a cabinet meeting, she offhandedly mentions to her inner circle advisors, she said, we inherited quite the budget crunch from President Trump. Remember, this is in 2000. It was a joke about Donald's run for president at the time as an independent. But 16 years later? Hmm. Earlier in the show's history, in, on January 23rd, 1992, in the Lisa the Greek episode, Lisa predicted the Washington Redskins Super Bowl win three days before the team defeated the Buffalo Bills. The next year, they re-released the same episode, dubbing in a prediction about the current teams, the teams that were in the Super Bowl. They predicted a Cowboys win, and Dallas beat the Buffalo Bills 52 to 17, and no, I am not picking on Buffalo. It just happened that way. The show, always quick to uh, poke fun at their parent company, 20th Century Fox, during the November 8th, 1998 episode, When You Dish Upon the Star, threw in a visual cue to to a future event on a marquee outside the Springfield Theater. It said... 20th Century Fox, a division of Walt Disney Company. Just short of 20 years later, in July 2018, Fox was bought out by the House of Mouse. You knew that, right? Fox is owned by Disney? They are. Finally, on Valentine's Day, which appropriately is coming up soon, Valentine's Day 2010, Boy Meets Curl, the 12th episode of the show, show's 21st season. It's a long-running show. Homer and Marge are recruited to play on the Team USA's Olympic curling team. Woo! The team beats Sweden to win the gold medal. Eight years later, this exact result was realized by the American curlers against Sweden in the Pyeongchang Winter Games. The Hollywood Reporter, which was my source for all of these, pointed out far more things. I'm not going to bore you with all 31 of those things, but they, they were striking enough in my mind to want to bring them up because we're going to talk about predictions today. I'm kind of stunned by the prognosticative prowess That's a fancy word for predicting. It's really hard to pronounce, too. You want to try it? No, no, anyway. Prognosticative. I actually practiced that this morning. Prowess of these script writers of this show. Aren't you impressed? Yeah. I mean, how did they get so many things right? Did one of them own a a 1981 DeLorean uh, modified by Dr. Emmett Brown? Maybe not. So how many of you have been correct when making a speculative stab at future outcomes? 
Occasionally. Uh, not many times, though. We kind of guess at what's going to come, but we're not really great at it. I have correctly guessed the winner of the Super Bowl a handful of times in my life, but all I was doing really was announcing who I wanted to win. Yes? I am predicting it again. Oh, okay. He's wearing a Chiefs hat. All right. So anyway, um, I will I will probably have been wrong about the Super Bowl as many times as I have been right. And I'm not going to make a prediction today because such things are not my chief's aim in life. Ooh. All right. Human beings simply aren't great at making precise predictions about yet to come happenings. If if we were good at it, there would be no odds makers in Vegas today. They'd be broke. Seriously, if all of us knew what was going on, why would we gamble? <laughs> why would we gamble? Anyway, but anyway, uh, Vegas, they're counting on you being wrong. They're betting on you being wrong. All right, so the prophets of the Old Testament have a better track record than most when it comes to matching predictions to outcomes. Hundreds of years before Jesus showed up, they predicted where he'd be born and much about what he'd be like and what he would do in the world and for the world. So why are these guys, these prophets, able to get the future right? Because God, who knows what's coming, gave them the inside scoop, told them what was ahead. How much more could Jesus and did Jesus, God's own son, get things right when looking forward in time? I mean, how could Jesus make a mistake? He's God, right? So last week we ended with a brief prophetic word from Jesus in Luke 9:27. Our master spoke these words to the 12. He said, "Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God." Sounds like a prediction to me. You? So when did this come true? Well, in some sense, it came true for all those who were present at that time when the Holy Spirit came upon the church at Pentecost, which we read about in Acts chapter 2. That's when the rule of Jesus became evident to the people of the world. But in the shorter term, there's another incident which seems to be the fulfillment of Jesus' prediction. The beginning of the story of this happening is found in Luke chapter 9, and you guessed it, we're at verse 28. If your Bible isn't already open to Luke chapter 9, get there. When you're there, note the heading over the section which begins with verse 28. Does the title include a big long word? Not prognosticative, but it includes that word transfiguration. That's what mine says, the transfiguration. What does transfiguration mean? Well, let me tell you. Transfiguration is a complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful or spiritual state. Thank you, Oxford Dictionary. It's similar to transformation. Uh, like similar to the transformation that when you like remodel your bathroom at home, it moves from this ugly thing to a more beautiful thing. Or when you repaint a wall or when you go someplace and they do a expert pedicure or manicure. That was manicure, sorry. <laughs> or ladies, when you put on your fancy dips and creams on your face, you become more beautiful. Not that you weren't beautiful before. It's like those things, transfiguration is, except on steroids and more sudden and more stunning. So the story we're going to read now is about someone we've seen before, Jesus, becoming suddenly and stunningly more beautiful. He's the one who's going to be transfigured, and I think you'll see that as we read Luke 9, 28 to 36. So here we go. So Jesus predicted, some of you will not die before you see the kingdom of 
God coming in glory, and then this, ha- this is what happens. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to them, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. I love how the Bible sometimes says they didn't get it. Okay, verse 34. While he, that is Peter, was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. So Jesus, after talking about his death and encouraging his disciples to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him, that's what we listened to him say last week, says some of them are going to see the kingdom of God before they die. And eight days later, sure enough, Peter, James, and John witness what we just read about. They see Jesus transfigured, transformed, made more stunningly beautiful, of more spiritual, whatever. They see him transfigured before them. They see his divine nature on display. His face and clothes get bright and shiny. If you were there as one of those three, don't you think you'd have been a little bit overwhelmed? Yeah. It's not every day that you see someone start glowing. It might make you stutter and stammer a bit. Let me introduce you to one of my friends. This is Andre. Andre coaches uh, track and field out at Pratt Community College. He coaches sprinters. He's a super friendly guy, easy to talk with, fun to be around. This is also Andre when he was younger. Andre was a top collegiate athlete while attending the University of Iowa. And after his stint as a Hawkeye, Andre, that's him at the bottom left, grinning and waving at everybody, he ran for Team USA in the 1999 World Indoor Championships. And this 4x400 relay team, which he is, was part of, the one that's pictured there on the screen, set a world record in their gold medal performance there. I learned most of this before I first talked to Andre. I was a bit awestruck and probably acted a bit like Peter did. I'd never met a former world record, before, record holder before, have you? Yeah, I, maybe some of you met Andre, I don't know. But thankfully, Andre overlooked my silliness for long enough to allow camaraderie to bloom, and we talk to each other on a regular basis now. So Jesus is more than a world record holder. He's fully God, fully human, son of God. And in this moment atop a mountain, three of his disciples catch a glimpse of him in all of his glory, his divine glory. He, he looks like God's son all of a sudden, not just like a regular d- dude. John, one of, one of the three that are there, while exiled later in his life in a, on a prison island, had a vision of Jesus. What John saw of Jesus in this revelation was even more intense than what was shown to him and his two friendship, friends on this mountaintop. So listen here to what John writes of Jesus' appearance in Revelation 1, 9 through 18. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in, Christ, in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He's in jail. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, not Pennsylvania, and Laodicea. 
Verse 12, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a gold sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, John writes, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades." So if you, in a non-eternal body, meet up with Jesus in full glory mode, you're going to fall on your feet, on your face, like you're dead. Jesus is awesome in the truest sense of that overused word. He's, he's inspire, he inspires awe when you see him. He strikes awe in the heart. So look at John. He falls as Jesus at Jesus' glowing like bronze feet. He's over overwhelmed. If I can add an over to the overwhelmed. He's over overwhelmed by the royal son of God's fiery eyes, his nearly unbearable voice, and his blindingly bright face. Sounds like the same one that they met on that mountain, doesn't it? We like to picture Jesus as meek and mild. We imagine him as a guy that we could, you know, sit down on the couch and kick our feet up with and talk to, just like, you know, an everyday guy. He is worthy of worship. He is the son of God, and we need to remember that. Yes, he invites us into relationship with us. Yes, he loves us, but he's also God's son. Don't forget that. All right. Back to Luke. Jesus made suddenly more beautiful and glorious, or however you want to say that, is talking with a couple of guys while Peter, James, and John stare. Who are these two newcomers? Moses and Elijah, right? So why these two? Why not Abraham or David or Esther or somebody else from the Old Testament? Well, this is what we find from our good folks, uh, the good folks that got questions. Symbolically, the appearance of Moses and Elijah represented the law and the prophets. In other words, the whole of the Old Testament. But God's voice from heaven, listen to him, clearly showed that the law and the prophets must give way to Jesus. The one who is the new and living way is replacing the old. He is the fulfillment of the law and the countless prophecies of the Old Testament. Makes sense, right? Jesus is the Savior of the world foretold in the Old Testament. He's the one who is the completion of the story of God's work through history to restore that broken relationship between himself and and people, fallen humanity. The law only covered up sin for a time, or obeying the law only covers up sin. It doesn't take care of it fully. The prophets only pointed out when people failed to follow God. Jesus saves despite our failures. We're getting ahead of ourselves, however. The cross is still down the road, right? But you can see in this moment, on the Mount of Transfiguration, a hint of what's to come. So what is Jesus discussing with the law guy and the prophet? They're discussing his exodus. That's the word that's here. The NIV calls it departure, but it's really the word exodus. Jesus is going to, like Moses, lead an exodus, an exodus from sin. He's going to lead, he's going to form a new people. Who are no longer slaved, he's gonna un, un he's gonna un enslave sinners. I said that say that right? Sinners are no longer gonna be in, in slavery to sin. A new people. God is forming a new people. This new nation is going to be a global group of Jesus trusters. 
You, me, we're in this community if we're believers. We've been led out of sin and into freedom. We've been rescued. No more slavery. You don't have to sin. Did you know that? You don't have to because Jesus has set you free from that. This is the good news. We don't have to continue in the fallen state we were in when we were born. We can be set free. All right, let's talk about Peter now. Is it any wonder that this poor guy starts sputtering about making shelters on a mountainside? His brain is blown by Jesus' new appearance and the lawgiver and the rain stopper showing up. Peter senses something special is going on, and so he wants to commemorate the occasion by building a shrine or two or three. And while Peter's still talking, he and James and John and the three conversers are enfolded in this misty dimness, which was likely the presence of God. There are numerous places in the Old Testament where God's presence is made known and made evident by something that looks like smoke or a cloud. Most notably, when they built the tabernacle and began to use it, a cloud came and filled the temple or filled the tabernacle, this tent temple, and Moses was unable to go in because of the presence of God. From the cloud comes a voice. Look at verse 35 with me. Here's the father's words. He said, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. This message that they get here is much the same message as the one that John the Baptist heard when he baptized Jesus. God the Father is making it as plain as plain can be that Jesus is his son. Should you pay attention to God's son and what he says? Yes. A million times yes. Listen to what Jesus say, says and do it. You remember that parable that Jesus said the wise man built his house upon the rock. Remember that? It's not, you, you do what Jesus says. That's the way to a secure foundation. Obedience is the way. Listening. Remember, in the Hebrew way of thinking, listening doesn't mean just hearing the words and off they go. It means hearing and doing what they say. So uh, the cloud cover covers them and then it lifts and Peter and the sons of Zebedee find themselves alone with Jesus. Moses and Elijah have gone. God's representatives are no longer there with them. Verse 36 mentions that the three didn't tell anybody about this happening at the time. Other gospel writers note that a command from Jesus kept they, that Jesus commanded them to keep it on the down low. But Luke gives us less detail. All we know is that they didn't talk about the transfiguration at the time. So not everybody knew about this until later. So let's read a bit more. The next story in Luke chapter 9 is connected to this one and actually also linked back to our Your Turn stuff that we talked about last week. I think you'll see that. So read along with me. Luke 9, starting at verse 37. We're going to read through 43 right now. The next day, so Jesus and the three have been on the mountain. The cloud came. They, the cloud left. The next day after that, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him, that is Jesus. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him into the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. So, Jesus, no longer bright and shiny in appearance, comes down from the mountain with his three stunned friends and finds the rest of his crew in a bit of a pickle. 
They've tried to drive out a demon like they did a week or two before, but the spirit in this boy hasn't given ground. The possessed kid is still under the enemy's sway. Jesus learns all this from the boy's father who's thrown himself at Jesus' feet, begging for relief from the spirit's torments. He wants his son to be free. What does Jesus say in response to all this? You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? So is Jesus throwing shade on the faith of every person in the crowd, or is this more of a rebuke for his disciples, directed at them? Is he frustrated with the man who's begging for relief or with the nine disciples that he left in the valley who couldn't seem to drive out the demon? I think it's mostly the latter. The disciples had been given power and authority to drive out demons as part of their recent your turn venture into the world. They should have had faith enough to pull this smallish thing off with God's help. Perhaps, and I am speculating here, it, they thought that they could manage in their own power. Though this demon would, though this demon would obey, then the, this demon would have obeyed their rebuke. In Matthew 17, we find Jesus speaking, this is the same story in, in Matthew 17, we find Jesus speaking after the boy is set free from the devil's bondage. Listen carefully to what Matthew adds to the mix. In response to a simple question from his followers, in verse 19, Jesus speaks. So listen to what he says. Verse 19, Matthew 17, 19, and 20 says this. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And then there's this from Mark 9, 28 and 29. Still, same story, same situation. After Jesus had got indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind come out only by prayer. Faith-filled prayer or faith-filled prayers is what matters. Because it's God's work, not ours, that causes demons to depart. Without God's work in us and through us, no one gets free from sin. No one gets rescued from addiction. Nobody is healed of any ailments. It's God. So were the disciples acting on their own power? Seems so. God help us. God help us to sense what he's directing us to do so that we might, in trust, do what he gives us. Amen? All right, let's read one more short paragraph from Luke chapter 9. Verses 43, the second part of it anyway, through 45, wrap up this day in Jesus' life. Verse 43, while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Jesus, God's Son, again knows what's coming. He's predicting an untimely end to his life. He's going to be delivered into the hands of men, which is hinting at his arrest in this mock trial that's going to take place and his execution. His friends, they hear him say that, but they're clueless. They don't get it, and they're too afraid to ask. No one wants to look foolish. You ever miss out on knowing how to do something or what to do next because you're embarrassed to ask? where they're at. So that's all of Luke 9 that we're going to cover today. Hopefully we'll get through the rest of the chapter next week, though I can see how the last section might take us a little bit more time than we have, but we'll see. In the meantime, let's wrap 
things up with a few questions to consider as we respond to God. Are you certain Jesus is God's son and that salvation is available only through him? Are you worshiping Jesus with the awe and the reverence that is his due? Are you listening to Jesus' words and obeying him in all things? Are you praying with faith for the needs of the hurting people around you and for yourself? Whether they're believers or not, you can bring the needs of your friends and your neighbors and your enemies to God. I want to encourage you to think on these things as we take a few moments to respond to God in silence, listening to what God might have for us. I trust that Jesus is going to speak because he wants us to understand what he has for us. So respond to him. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give you some time to respond. God, thank you that you sent your son Jesus and and that you revealed him to the disciples so that we could know that he is, in fact, your son. And because he's your son, God, we want to listen to him. And you've given us your spirit so that we can hear him. And I pray, God, that you help us to be obedient in all things, to be obedient at each moment of our lives. God, I pray that you would speak to us now and encourage us. Help us to hear what you have for us today and tomorrow and the next day, whenever, wherever we're going. God, help us to be attuned and in tune with what you're saying so that we can, we can be obedient. Help us to listen now. Amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.